Hey guys, it's Ryan. In this video, we're going to talk about internal bleaching. So as we talked about in the video on external bleaching, tooth bleaching seems pretty straightforward, has some risks, but if you follow the general guidelines and consult a dentist before use, you can have a really nice result. But what about for non-vital or dead teeth? It is not sufficient to bleach from the outside most of the time for a non-vital tooth because of the nature of the discoloration. We're no longer talking about stains from wine and coffee. This is something else entirely. So internal bleaching is synonymous with these two terms right here, which help inform the definition. Intracoronal means inside or within the, the crown. And this is referring to the fact that the bleaching agent is actually being inserted into the crown of the tooth in order to bleach it. And non-vital bleaching refers to lightening teeth that have undergone a root canal treatment, their pulps have died, and have been cleaned out. So I hinted before that it's not sufficient to bleach a dead tooth from the outside because of the nature of the discoloration. Well, what do I mean by that? So let's talk about several causes of tooth discoloration and whether they should be bleached internally or externally. So we'll start with acquired or natural uh, causes of discoloration, the first and most common of which is pulp necrosis. And this is due to bacterial, mechanical, or chemical irritation of the pulp. Tissue disintegration byproducts can permeate the dentinal tubules from inside the tooth, and so this tooth should be bleached internally for the best result, because the discoloration is originating from inside the tooth. Here is an example of a tooth that has undergone pulpal necrosis. So for bleaching from the outside, it's not going to be as effective as if we bleached from the inside, because that's where the discoloration byproducts, the byproducts causing this, this grayness, have originated from. So we want to bleach from the inside out. Now intrapulpal hemorrhage is similar. It can be due to trauma to the tooth which disrupts and ruptures coronal blood vessels. Blood disintegration byproducts like iron sulfides leak into dental tubules and cause sort of like a tooth bruise which can also appear similar. Now this can reverse itself if the tooth heals, but otherwise should be bleached internally. Of course, when I say should be bleached, bleaching is entirely elective. It, it depends on the patient whether or not this discoloration really bothers them. Now calcific metamorphosis is a fancy term, um, and it's referring to the formation of tertiary dentin following trauma to a tooth that did not cause necrosis like in the first case. So in some cases, the tooth is able to basically form a callus and heal itself. This causes a loss of translucency and causes the tooth to become sort of yellow, orangey, brown. You can attempt external bleaching first, or otherwise you can do a root canal and then try to internally bleach um, a tooth like this. So that's an example of calcific metamorphosis. So some more acquired or natural causes of discoloration, age is one of them. Now the color can change due to extensive dentin apposition, thinning of enamel, and accumulation of food and drink stains. Also previous restorations can just degrade over time, and all these things can contribute to the sort of yellowing of teeth as we age. Now this should just be bleached externally. This isn't uh, a form of discoloration that originated from inside the tooth. So we can um, stick with external bleaching, a much more conservative approach in that situation. There are also a number of developmental defects that um, a patient can have. Uh, the first most common of which might be fluorosis. And this is uh, due to ingestion of excessive amounts of fluoride during tooth formation uh, from in utero to a couple years old. And the enamel, this can cause enamel hypoplasia, it's sort of this chalky enamel that absorbs stains very easily. So if it's more of a brownish 
fluorosis, more of a simple fluorosis, this should be bleached externally. If it's more opaque and white, sort of like this image here, bleaching is not really going to do a whole lot, right? Because it's making the tooth more white. So bleaching would not be a great option here. Sometimes there are cases of, of microabrasion that can work very well for cases of fluorosis. Now systemic drugs, you may have heard of tetracycline staining. So ingestion of this drug can, um, during again, during the years of tooth formation, may cause uh, discoloration, can be yellow, can be brown, can be dark gray, like in this picture here. And the tetracycline basically binds to calcium and is incorporated into tooth dentin. So you can bleach externally for lighter discolorations, but otherwise you'll need a root canal and bleach, uh, internal bleaching for all discolorations, um, and you'll have good success if you, if you do that. Now there are also um, other things here. We have hypocalcification and we have hypoplasia. These, these situations here, you can typically bleach externally or use an acid pumice method and, and have pretty good results. So the basic uh, thing that I want to portray here is that intrinsic discolorations are incorporated into tooth structure during odontogenesis, and usually they occur, uh, they, they'll bind to the dentin layer, and so they're difficult to bleach externally. So if a discoloration affects the dentin, then we want to bleach internally. And if a discoloration affects the enamel, then we want to bleach externally. So dentin internal, enamel external. Now, we can also, as dentists or endodontists, cause discoloration during or as a, as a uh, sequela of the procedure. So obturating materials, most common of which could be the sealer, which contains uh, some silver, incompletely removing materials from the pulp chamber results in a very dark discoloration, like seen here. The prognosis of bleaching depends on the sealer used. Now also, if you're doing a root canal on a non-vital tooth and you leave behind pulp, usually the pulp horns, this can cause gradual discoloration. And internal bleaching is usually successful here because this is organic in nature. It's the actual uh, original uh, organic material of the tooth that's causing this discoloration. So in those cases, internal bleaching is pretty effective. Medicaments, um, especially iodoform-based ones, have the potential to cause internal discoloration of dentin. And again, internal bleaching can correct this. Now, of course, you can just crown root canal treated posterior teeth because they'll need crowns anyway if they're in occlusion. But since we can composite anterior teeth, that's why we need bleaching. We're not usually going to be crowning anterior teeth unless the restoration is very extensive. Um, so in the case that we can use composite, we might have a the rest of the tooth experiencing some severe discoloration in which case internal bleaching is a great option. So here are bleaching materials used. We talked extensively about hydrogen peroxide and carbamide peroxide in our video on external bleaching, but these are actually not uh, indicated in most cases for internal bleaching because they're too potent. They can cause uh, damage to um, tissue on contact and sodium perborate is more easily controlled and, and much safer to use. So sodium perborate is our material of choice when we're talking about internal bleaching. So here are some of the indications and contraindications of internal bleaching. We already talked about this, so we'll move on to the next slide. So there are basically two techniques for internal bleaching. Thermocatalytic is referring to the use of heat 
in order to uh, accelerate the bleaching process. So both of them are similar in that we place an oxidizing agent in the pulp chamber and then thermocatalytic, we use heat to release oxygen. But there are several reported risks due to irritation to cementum and PDL. So heat is contraindicated, and this method in general is not recommended for safety reasons. Now, walking bleach requires less chair time, is more comfortable for the patient, safer, and we'll, let's talk about this one a little bit more. So for the walking bleach method, here's sort of a, a general guideline for how to perform this procedure in office. And of, course, of course, all um, internal bleaching has to be done in office because this is a lot more technically involved than an external bleaching case. So first we want to take a radiograph. We want to take an x-ray to assess the status of the periapical tissues and the quality of the current root canal treatment. Now, a failed previous treatment or a questionable obturation requires retreatment before proceeding to the bleaching step. So one way to think about this is you need to have a strong seal before you can bleach the inside. Otherwise, if we don't have a strong seal, you can have bleaching agent that we're going to place in the crown of the tooth. It can leak through the root canal treatment and can cause irritation and inflammation of the periapical tissues, which is never a good thing. Now, if there are defective restorations on this, on this tooth, then we need to make sure that we replace all these, again, for the same logic. We don't want to have any leaky areas where this bleach material can sort of leak out of the tooth. Um, as with any bleaching case, we want to check shade, we want to evaluate the color with a special bleaching shade guide, and take clinical photos for reference. It's always nice to show the patient um, as you're sort of progressing with this bleaching treatment. Uh, we want to make sure we isolate with a rubber dam, again, so this bleaching material isn't leaking all over the place. Using sodium perborate is a nice... Um, a nice safety measure. It's safer than the other two materials that we mentioned, but you still want to go through all these steps to have the best possible outcome. Then we do an access prep, which is um, accessing the pulpal space of the tooth. So we go in from the lingual for all of these anterior teeth. Of course, we don't want to make this large hole in the facial surface of the tooth, so we're going in from the tongue side then we access, we remove any pulp horn remnants if there are any. We take out all the obturating materials in the chamber so that we get this nice wide open space that we can see and we can access the inside of the crown. So you can optionally remove a thin layer of um, stained dentin with like a round burn, a slow speed handpiece. This can also open tubules for better penetration of the bleaching agent. But again, that's totally an optional step. Next, we'd want to remove uh, root filling material, just apical to the CEJ. If this is our CEJ, we want to remove maybe one or two millimeters of material is a nice guideline. And then we'll place in that space that I just drew, like a one to two millimeter um, apical seal with glass ionomer or some other barrier material, some other base to minimize leakage of bleaching agents to the periapical region, through accessory canals to the PDL. So again, we're just trying to keep the bleaching agent in this area of the crown because that's the only area we care about bleaching. We don't need it to be leaking all over the root and all over to the periodontium. In fact, we don't want that. Then we mix the paste um, you mix the sodium perborate with an inert liquid like water or saline to the consistency of wet sand. Then we place um, an interim restorative material or a cavit to on um, over the top of this wet sand to at least three millimeters to ensure a good seal coronally, so the bleaching agent won't leak out. And then the patient um, will go about their daily routine. 
they'll walk for about a few weeks and then return to repeat the procedure and replace the, the, the wet sand that we placed in there and do this about three to four times until the ideal color is achieved or no more progress is evident. So as with anything, there are some risks, but luckily most of these can be mitigated with proper technique. So external cervical root resorption is one of the most common and heat and potent oxidizers like hydrogen peroxide are risk factors. Another side effect is that residual peroxide of the bleaching agents may affect the bonding strength of composites to the tooth. It can also cause chemical burns, and there's just not enough evidence for this, but can be a potential risk. So now let's talk about a practice question. This is fun. We can apply what we learned in the last two videos on external and internal bleaching to an actual real life case. So pause the video and then we'll talk about this. Okay, so a patient reports to your office with history of trauma to tooth number eight. So we see right here the tooth was maybe luxated slightly, it's discolored. The patient reports it's asymptomatic. The patient wants you to fix the color. So what do you suggest? So this is a pretty classic case of something we talked about earlier in this video, and we call it calcific metamorphosis. You can see clinically, the tooth has turned sort of an orangey color, and the radiograph shows that the pulp has shrunk to a point where it's not even visible on the x-ray. I can't even trace this one. You can see the pulp is, is very easy to trace. It's pretty, pretty patent here. I, you can't even really see where that pulp canal or the pulp chamber is. So a lot of tertiary dentin was laid down. This is referred to as pulp canal obliteration. It's a natural response of a tooth to trauma. Now, before we talk about treatment options, one thing to stress is there's not really a correct answer here. It's just fun to talk about and think through the possible options. So one tenant that I think is always, almost always relevant is to be as conservative as possible. In that vein, the first thing to do to probably try is a single tooth external bleaching, like make a custom tray for the patient and apply the, peroxide, apply the peroxide gel in office for a series of appointments, or have the patient carefully do this at home. And if that doesn't work, then you can start to think about either doing a conservative veneer prep on the tooth, or do something that we talked about in an endo access through the lingual. Now, although the pulp canal is not visible on the x-ray, it's still present, just to a microscopic degree. An endodontist with a microscope would stand the best chance at finding the canal here, but still, you can attempt to do a lingual access, search for the canal, and even if you don't find it, forgo any root canal treatment, place a base where you think the canal would be, and then place that sodium perborate like we talked about for the walking bleach method. Now these are just three different things of many that you could choose to do for this case, but I hope you had found it fun to apply the things we talked about in the last two videos to a real life situation. So thanks for watching guys. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Um, like, Give this video a like if you found it helpful and leave a comment for any future videos you might like to see on this channel. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you all next time.